Really pleased to have Dr. Bott here. She's the Director of Adult Congenital Heart Disease and Outpatient Cardiology at Massachusetts General Hospital. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, I look like a little talking head when I sit behind a podium, so I'm going to come out here a little bit um, just so we can be a little closer. I'm going to ask you guys to interact even from the back. So um, when I ask questions, feel free to yell out answers. It's completely OK. Um, I've been asked to do a deep dive into adult congenital heart disease. Um, AV septal defects, and so we'll have a little fun with that today. We'll talk about the anatomy, but that's been a little bit done, so we can go fast through that. We'll talk about factors that influence outcomes in atrioventricular septal defects, and then we'll talk about an approach to longitudinal care um, in the next 15 minutes. Um, we've already talked about the different types of atrial septal defects. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning, uh, we did a paper on the older adult with adult congenital heart disease a few years ago, and uh, the population is growing, right? We now have adults with congenital heart disease. Almost 10 to 15 percent of them are over age 60. That makes me really happy because we used to call an older adult over age 40, and that was completely depressing to me. Um, so, so a few things that happen in older adulthood that are worth looking for. Those ostium secundums that are completely closed, surgically closed, were evolving mitral regurgitation in their 60s and 70s. Didn't see it before, no prolapse before. Out of the blue, sixth and seventh decades, there it comes. Worth seeing these people keeping them in care. Similarly, the sinus venosus patients, they often have a low or a junctional atrial rhythm, uh, a low atrial rhythm or a junctional rhythm, which is how we help diagnose these people. But in older age, a lot of them are having sinus node dysfunction. So there are things that are evolving even in the 60s for these people that we want to keep following. For the ostium primum, uh, we'll go through the issues, but mitral regurgitation continues to be our biggest bane kind of of our existence for that. Um, and we'll talk about why. So uh, I want to start with a case. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with uh, one of your course directors, uh, Dr. McGillivray, for many years at Mass General. And this was a patient that uh, we saw together. A uh, 16-year-old kid. He's the son of a cardiologist. He went down to Haiti with his dad, where they did volunteer work. And he went in, and he was so proud. Um, he was setting up the EKG machine. He did an EKG on himself. And he goes, Dad, look, the EKG machine works. <laughs> OK. We learned earlier today. We see a left axis. We see a little bit of a first degree heart block. We see a right bundle. What does this kid have? He has a flow murmur to his upper sternal border, kind of like pulmonary extra flow. He has a tricuspid murmur of TR from a dilated RV. He has a widely split fixed S2. Yep, what does he have yelled louder? He has an AS, he has a primum ASD, okay? His son has, not the one that we say, hey, I can close with these devices. He is the one that says, hey, something looks wrong, and you're going to need surgery. So dad looks at this, gets concerned, and does an echocardiogram. Um, this is actually the echo when he came back home uh, from there. So if we look here, this is what we were talking about before Dr. Phillips said. The valves are at the same level here, OK? Your tricuspid valve should be apically displaced a little bit. It is not. That is sine qua non. We have a prima ASD. There's a prima ASD in case you missed it. There it is. And there's the flow going through it. There's regurgitation actually coming from both valves as well as flow from left to right um, through that. Uh, this is the right side, sorry, over here. This is the left side over here, as well as uh, left to right flow through the ASD. When we look in short axis now, we're talking about the mitral valve. We're going to call it the mitral valve, and then we're going to tell you why we don't call it the mitral valve. Um, but if you play that again, see this little cleft up here in the mitral valve. It's not a full circle but you see that little opening there, and that's where the regurgitation is going to come from. That's also the area that in younger kids we're going to want to stitch up a little bit to cinch that, right, so you don't have regurgitation anymore, except don't over cinch it in childhood because the kid's going to grow and you don't want to give them mitral stenosis. So we can't completely make it normal when they're younger. We have to leave it a little bit open, and we're going to get mitral regurgitation as they grow older, but it was better than getting mitral stenosis when they're younger, right? So why? What happens? Um, when you think about AV septal defects, Dr. Singh was exactly right. Endocardial cushion defects, prima ASD, 100 names for this. You do not anymore have a mitral annulus and a tricuspid annulus separate. You have one big annulus in the middle of the heart. You have five leaflets around that annulus, and they all meet in the middle. And then you may or may not have some, premium sept some septum coming down from the atrial side and some ventricular septum coming up to meet. And that's how you make that cross in the middle of the heart. OK? So if you look here, one annulus. There are not two. So we're not going to call it a tricuspid, because it's not actually going to be three leaflets on that side. 
It's going to be part of the anterior. It's going to be part of the posterior. And it's going to be two mural leaflets. So actually, there's four little leaflets there. And then the mitral side looks nothing like a mitre, and it doesn't have its own annulus. It's one leaflet out here, this left mural leaflet, part of the superior and part of this inferior leaflet meeting. Okay? This side can close easier. You've got four things trying to come in and close on the right. On the left side, that mural leaflet is coming in. The superior and inferior are coming down. But they're just not going to meet perfectly, and you're going to have a cleft. Okay? Left AV valve, right AV valve. Better way to talk about it than a mitral and a tricuspid. Most important thing about, I think, adult congenital heart disease in general, don't worry about the anatomy. You can always Google it, right? No, seriously. Think about the physiology. And I think this has been said by Dr. Singh and by Dr. Phillips and by Dr. Lin in the beginning. Think about the physiology. That's the part that's also the most interesting. If we look down here, physiology is going to vary. If you have an ASD and a VSD, you may have more flow that's going from left to right. You may have left heart dilation earlier than you would with a prima ASD alone. If you have primarily prima ASD like this kid, then you're going to have massive right heart dilation. And then if you have primarily a VSD, that's going to act like what Dr. Singh just explained to you. Okay. Etiology. Um, 80% of patients with an atrioventricular septal defect have trisomy 21 Down syndrome. So please do make sure that your Down syndrome patients are getting checked. We're much better now than we were in the old days. But if you have an older Down syndrome who's 40 coming in, who hasn't gr had great health care, who's living out in the community where they don't have great health care, always think this might be an issue. Um, the opposite is not the true, right? It's not that 80% of trisomy 21 is going to have it, but probably a third of Down syndrome will have some level of um, an atrioventricular septal defect. Um, if you have anybody who has complicated things, situs, inversus, heterotaxy, please look for prima ASD. And presentation is going to depend on how big is your defect. A tiny prima may not do anything. A large prima may. Having a VSD plus an ASD may make a difference. And so all things to think about. What are you going to see? So if they haven't been operated on when they were younger, if it wasn't found, and they closed either the atrial or ventricular septal defect and cinched up to mitral valve, which is generally what we do, but they're anew, you'll either see, like this 16-year-old kid, prima ASD with a dilated right heart. You may see a big hole in the middle of the heart, an atrial ventricular septal defect that has both an ASD and a VSD. But in that case, they've either eyes and mangered because they've sent all the blood flow to the right and they've flooded their lungs, or you'll hear a harsh murmur at the upper sternal border of some pulmonic stenosis. Why? Because nature is smart. If you have a big hole in your heart, you oftentimes get pulmonic stenosis along with it, the heart's own way of protecting the lungs from pulmonary overcirculation. Those are the kind of unoperated people you may see. Or you'll see operated like we just talked about. Um, what are the late complications? So recurrent left AV valve regurgitation. Even if you have fixed it before, it is going to come back to you 60% of the time. It is going to need a re-repair, 60% of the time, OK? So that's not done just because they took care of it when they were younger. You may have subaortic stenosis, like Dr. Phillips showed earlier, that elongated LVOT. A few things can happen. One is that left AV valve may have chordae that go to the septum and block the outflow. And the other is actually the flow through that elongated area makes the muscle grow a little bit. And you can actually get a membrane in that area. So important to say, oh, I have a new harsh murmur there. What's happening? And take a look at that um, LVOT area. And the last is complete heart block. So if you have a hole in the middle of your heart, you cannot have an AV node in the middle of your heart, right? So it has to come from somewhere else. And so when we look at it, we actually say the AV node is displaced. And so instead of being here, OK, it's back here, posterior inferior location. Not only look at its location, which is partly why you have that left axis, but look at the length of the course that needs to be traversed for you to then get down to do your bundles. OK? So first degree AV block, most certainly. Some people advance levels of block as they get older. Sometimes after coming out of the OR, although they can really see what they're doing, and you don't usually end up with heart block for these patients, but important that if it was not done by somebody who's experienced in knowing congenital heart disease, but somebody else who was doing the best that they could, they were in a community where they didn't have access, et cetera, important to look for these kind of things, OK? Um, we can now diagnose this on fetal echo. So if you have a fetal echo, actually even on your survey, Usually, if it's an obvious enough 
large AV canal or atrioventricular septal defect, even if you haven't done a fetal echo specifically, oftentimes just on the ultrasound survey, we're able to catch this early. And so up here you can see, here's your RV, here's your LV, here's some lack of ventricular septum here. Valves are on the same level, and here's one big common atrium. So what would you expect? Our young kid comes home, and he's going to go to surgery. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He is awesome. Um, he was on the varsity team as a sophomore for basketball. Um, completely active, in shape, nicest, sweetest kid, has three older sisters who take very good care of him. Um, and uh, he comes home and says, OK, we got to take care of this. We'll take care of it. We do surgery. We close his atrial septum. We cinch up his mitral valve. Let's think about how he's going to do and what his follow-up's going to be. So the new guidelines change how you think about adult congenital heart disease. We no longer just say anatomy, because we've all agreed anatomy alone is not the issue. It's physiology. So for patients, we look at physiologic stage. Are you stage A? Stage A meaning you're feeling really well. You can do everything you want. Um, you can be active and do exercise. You're not really having symptoms. If you're stage A, see me once every two to three years, right? See your local doctor, probably annually, especially in these ages. Please keep them in care if they don't think they need to come every year. They don't remember three years from now they were supposed to do something, right? Um, physiologic stage B, which is I can do almost everything, but if I really push myself, I feel it. This kind of mirrors New York Heart Association class, if you will. Stage C, I can barely get done with my activities of daily living, really not much more than that. And stage D is, wow, I'm kind of falling apart, right? And so our follow-up for this young man was going to be based on his physiologic stage. He came in physiologic stage A, and we fixed him. And uh, then he came in for follow-up. How do you think he looked? Raise your hand if you think he, he looked awesome. OK. Good. Raise your hand if I'm asking the question, and therefore, he really didn't look that hot. OK. So um, he was tired, and that RV started to come back down in size, but did not come back in function in the first six months as quickly as we would have liked. OK? It teaches you to respect the physiology of what is happening, as well as the strength of the individual with congenital heart disease. It is amazing what these people can do and tolerate. I would have been on the floor with a right ventricle as big as his. I just, I wouldn't have had good forward flow. I would have looked gray. Like things would have, he was playing varsity basketball. So it actually took him about six months to start to feel better. OK? Um, I'm going to tell you a quick different story just to make the point about young people being healthy. Uh, later today, you'll learn about coarctation. I want to tell you a quick story. I'm sorry, I'm totally going off topic. Um, so a uh, 26-year-old woman comes in. She wants to get pregnant. She has a coarct, and so we stent it. She does well. She's going to be OK. I get called upstairs to the bedside. Dr. Inglesis, who's our interventional um, cardiologist, is already in the room. I think, what has happened? Because if this was a tear, Tom would have her in the OR. You know, why is this happening? She's in reverse Trendelenburg, and he's on a chair. They roll me a stool, give me a saline bag, and tell me to stand up. We start squeezing saline bags into her because her healthy 26-year-old kidneys, which had had limited flow because of a narrowing in the aorta of coarct for so long, now got blood flow. And she was auto-diuresing like you wouldn't believe, to the point where she had a systolic blood pressure of 68. And the only thing to do was to put saline in her at the same rate that she was peeing. Um, so that, and, and about 25 minutes later, she was better and everything was fine. You have to respect the physiology of congenital heart disease. Didn't see that one coming, right? Um, but really, the body feels these things. And you have to look at the physiology every stage, how it changes. So for him, it took a little while. He was kind of physiologic stage C, then B. Um, and then he was back on varsity college. And now, actually, he's applying to medical school. Wants to be a cardiologist. Said he never wanted to do what his dad was doing. Um, so now he's not doing it because of his dad. He's doing it because of himself. And I have time. Um, and he is doing it um, because of a young girl who he met the next year when he went back down to volunteer, who had the same thing as him. Uh, the good Dr. McGillivray charged nothing and did her surgery. Um, and so he said, I'm doing it for those people. Um, if unrepaired, we talked about Eisenmenger. This is an Eisenmenger EKG, extreme right axis. You can see the clubbing and the cyanosis in the hands. This was an unrepaired VSD, actually. Um, and then I'll just end with two things. Multidisciplinary longitudinal care. It is what Dr. Lin and his team do here. It is what they do at Presbyterian. Um, and it is what we do. Multidisciplinary conferences with those of you in the community 
to go over your patients. Co-localized clinics in the community when you say, I've got a population of adult congenital large enough that I need you to come here and do this with me. We are all willing across the country to come out to you because adults with congenital heart disease really deserve spe specialty care in the areas where they live, so we can make that happen. Um, I put these in, and I just want you to look at them on your own later. There are some ec recommendations for exercise and sports participation and for mental health follow-up in this population. We don't ever have a chance to talk about those things. It is essential in quality of life, so please take a look in your syllabus later. Um, and I also put things to avoid. For recommendations for heart failure, um, I'm not saying avoid heart failure physicians. I'm actually saying the opposite. Please remember to call your heart failure physicians early if you notice that your patients are having those symptoms. Um, and lastly, uh, our holy grail is uh, risk prediction. Uh, this says you're in perfect health, which I'm afraid is an early sign of something eventually going wrong. We are always looking for the next thing for these patients and in a true ventricular septal defect, um, that mitral valve will be the key thing that you will look for in these individuals. Um, thank you guys very much.